Welcome back to Talk Salem with me, Charlotte Breer Edney. And as promised, we're going to be talking about the campaign to protect rural England right here in Hampshire, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary. And I've got Dee Haas from the CPRE in Hampshire. So tell us about what you're doing for your 50th anniversary. Well, we, we feel we should celebrate 50 years of campaigning for the countryside. I mean, it all started in Hampshire back in 1966. But in fact, CPRE um, nationally is also celebrating a 90th birthday this year. Wow. So, um, and the people who started CPRE way back 90 years ago, they were looking at the lack of um, any form of planning in the countryside or in our towns and cities. So they were really the, the forefathers of our planning system. We may not like our planning system sometimes, but it, it's good to have one, you know, because otherwise all you do is you just cut smother the countryside in, in houses and roads and signs and, and clutter and generally. why is it that you got involved? Why did I get involved? Well, my background, I'm a landscape architect um, by training, and I still work as a landscape architect um, part-time. And I've always been a great one for volunteering. I just really think it's important that we all pull our weight and do, you know, and I'm really passionate about the environment and the, the landscape in Hampshire. We are so lucky. I mean, to get here, I did a sort of, because I had to go and visit one of my sites on the way. So I did a, a wonderful route all the way through. It went over the South Downs and came down into this area. And I have to say, I just thought, my goodness, we, you know, we are so lucky. We've got this amazing landscape and countryside. Now, we, you know, we take it for granted a little bit, and people who live in towns perhaps don't have as much access to it as they should. One of the reasons we were seeing the MP in Gosport the other day, Carolyn Dynich, is that um, we're, we're, we've launched recently a campaign to try and resurrect the um, Greenbelt campaign that was started in 1966, and then again nearly happened in 1972. Now that was for South Hampshire, and the idea was to stop all those towns that were then growing like Topsy, Southampton, Portsmouth, Eastley, Gosport. How, how can we stop them from growing into each other and making one massive great city? And um, back in the 60s, there was a proposal for something called Solent City, mm -hmm. which would have looked a bit like Manhattan Island, only lying on its side instead of upright. Right. So it was um, high-rise uh, flats, it was big, long, straight roads, and it would have linked all of the towns that are currently may have, you know, trying their best to kind of coalesce, we call it in planning terms, get stuck together. Because I just think, if, if I, I've lived in London, I've lived in cities before Liverpool, and I think if you live in the city, you need to be able to get out quite easily and go and walk on some nice landscape. Just get some fresh air and your time off. You know, the worst thing, I think, would be to have a totally solid built up area all the way along the south coast that then went north and hit the edge of the South Downs National Park so there was no buffer between the city and the National Park. I just think that, um, you know, without this idea, how are we going to stop it from happening? I mean, there are so many new proposals for new towns and big, big housing, 6,000 houses at Wellborn. Um, Eastly at the moment are looking at their local plan and mm -hmm. one of our campaigners is involved in that and we're, we're looking at, you know, if we know we have to build houses, people need houses. There is a housing crisis in our area. I think it's an affordable housing crisis. I think that there are probably plenty of houses that are jolly expensive, but the people who really need them are the people who can't afford those. We need to find homes for everyone. But there are other ways of doing it other than giving a lot of green fields to developers. All right, so what are those other ways? Go on then. Well, one of them, and this is why, again, we're, going, we're, we're talking to all the MPs in South Hampshire at the moment. We'll probably work our way through the whole of Hampshire, <laughs> but it takes a lot of time. Um, and one of the things we, we think we should be looking at, I mean, brownfield sites for a start, there are still quite a lot of sites that are perhaps a bit more expensive to develop because they've had factories or, you know, like Daedalus, for example, is one, one good example. Um, we could start, we could build more on those. We could perhaps give incentives to get to build on brownfield sites. Um, the other thing is to look at some of the older housing estates, which are very low uh, density, and the houses are very poor quality. You know, they have very, very bad insulation. People, they cost a lot to heat. 
sometimes if you're living in a flat in one of those houses, you can hear next door ironing. You know, I mean, they're that bad. And so we could take those bit by bit and start to redevelop develop them, put better housing on them, perhaps a bit more high density. And I don't mean massive tower blocks with the problems that come with those. I think you can do, you know, I mean, if you, if you look in London, say, you know, a square in Mayfair, that's the highest density housing you can get. And actually, they're quite pleasant to live in, really, because they've got a bit of green in the middle and, you know, you've got terraced housing. So, you know, there are lots of ways of doing that. And I think at the moment we are, we are just taking the easy way out, if you like. And I think we're going to look back on this period one day and say, oh my goodness, what have we done? We've just built on top of all our countryside and we can't go out and walk our dogs anymore. Do you agree with that, Suzanne? Do you think we're going to look back and think, what the hell have we done? I think, if you think about when we looked back, too young, think about when you looked back at the high-rise blocks and the tower blocks that were built, mm. which were the second coming. I mean, people were just desperate to move into them mm. because they had inside bathrooms and all sorts of fabulous mm. stuff like that. Mm. Unfortunately, then degenerated. I think um, there are some fabulous examples. Round a redevelopment in Gosport is an astounding yes. re example of a redevelopment of what was, quite frankly, a sink estate. Yeah. And it is yeah, we so different look at now. That, actually, if you said to somebody three years ago, there's going to be a Costa coffee shop in the middle of Rauner in Gosport, they would have said it'll be firebombed in two days. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how bad it was. Mm. It was terrible. But it now is a very, very pleasant estate mm. with quite a lot of housing mm. on it. Mm. I think we, in Gosport, we're extraordinarily lucky. We have the coastline. We have got some mm. gorgeous walks. We have Alba Valley Country Park. Yes. Um, so that's, you know, hurrah for us, that's great. We do need to think of alternative ways of, of solving the housing crisis. We need to think of just looking at different ways that, that families live together to solve the housing crisis. We are slightly driven in this country by the home ownership, one home for one family. In other countries, particularly in Europe, they don't do that. They will quite frequently have granny living in the basement. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? Oh, granny oh, living granny. in the house, somebody else living in the, on another floor. And that's how they manage their shortage of housing. Mm. They look at things very differently. Mm. So you've, nice mentioned, you've, yeah, you've mentioned granny there, which kind of is going to bring me really nicely onto <laughs> some of the things that you are involved with. You've yeah. got a Gosport Community Day, and you're also involved in, I wrote it down, here we go, a new narrative about older people in the area so tell us a bit about that and some of it is to do with housing as well it it is absolutely um southeast england forum on aging cfa had a recent event in um palace of westminster one of their committee rooms gorgeous venue to go to i have to say <laughs> we all felt very special anyway at that we spoke about this new narrative because there is an image of older people in an aging population as being a massive drain on society there there aren't no doubt there are some vulnerable and fragile people, older people, but for the vast majority of older people, we are in fact um, net contributors to the economy. 40 billion this year, expected to be up to 75 billion by 2020. We are lively bright, we need employment opportunities, we need the best use of technology to enable people to live independent and free lives. We also need better housing for older people. Um, we have this bad, we've got a bit of a bad rep, us oldens. Um, first of all, we're called bed blockers. We're the ones that are causing problems in the NHS. And the other thing that we are now called apparently is house hoarders. So we've got this nice big four bedroomed house where right. the family have all grown up and cleared off, you know, and how very dare we. Um, the problem is people often say, well, you want to move to retirement now. And they then offer you a one bedroom flat. Well, actually, no, I don't. They might want to have a two-bedroom bungalow with a very small garden somewhere mm. in a square, in a muse where they could, there's a bit of community. Mm. And that means then that they can move there, live there happily, integrated in the community, and free up the larger family homes. So it is a matter of raising this new narrative, looking at an ageing population in a different way, talking to planners and developers and saying, stop the drive for starter homes, low-cost starter homes, which may not solve the problem, Let's also look at having houses that are suitable for older people, that are future-proofed, so you can get a wheelchair around it later, so that you have sockets that are halfway up the wall instead of, you know, right down there. Yeah. So that you have equipment in your kitchen 
that has large knobs that's very clear. Mm -hmm. Your door closers are push and pullers, a close to lever arch, which becomes a problem if you have mobility problems. Mm -hmm. And it's all these kind of things that you can do when you plan and build new mm -hmm. estates that mean they are much more friendly for older people to live in. Mm -hmm. well, where do you stand on putting, you know, having the old people in a sort of area together? In a I ghetto. Mean, do, do, yes. I mean, do you, I, <laughs> I think it would be quite nice if, you know, to have, have them spring, those sorts of um, developments sprinkled in amongst all the, new, the other it is, houses. I mean, what, you, uh, is there, have any studies been done about that? Yes, intergenerational living is much more productive in mm -hmm. terms of keeping older people you know more involved and of course then we are there to do things like babysitting and looking mm. after kids and all that kind of stuff mm. that is much better the problem um Housler development is going to be fabulous there's no two ways about it and that is going to be continued care living but there is a danger of them being as a separate part of society mm. I'm afraid we're coming to another break, so we're going to have to wrap that one up there. But coming up, we're going to be talking about wacky jobs and music that makes us happy. So do stay <laughs> tuned for that. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes.